Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call up that model which um, uh, Bryce had just kindly to present in a pinch. Um, uh, sorry? Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so, in order to get this, we're going to go to the folder for the um, for the event uh, and we'll go into example models um, and uh, within that example models uh, there's something called something like for sharing in class um, so example models um, oh sorry oh, oh, oh. there it is um, okay did I put it in the wrong 2018 oh there it is uh, uh, my did it, oh, sorry, this is 2018. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, example models, there's a thing called use in boot camp only. Okay. Um, and I'll be putting some additional models there in which people have some interest. Within that, there is a further folder called hypertension current as of da da da. Um, so if you go into there, you will find a bunch of uh, a bunch of features here. Now, um, the features that are under here uh, are are not so essential um, to the uh, the goals here. So I'm going to just download the model file itself. I think that this should be adequate for purpose. Um, so I'd like you to download the hypertension ALP file. Okay. The, the funny thing is it's it's like that, oh. but it looks like the battery is pretty good, so I'm not... I can play with it while you talk. You maybe, want. maybe, um... Yeah. Oh, uh, test. Oh, there you okay. Go. Okay. Mm. Mm. Um, maybe it was in some sort of pause state. So if you go to, um, to that use in bootcamp only, the hypertension, and download the hypertension model, um, I will open that along with you. Um, I had previously opened the kind of it in context. Um, the alternative is we can download it as a zipped file, but I prefer not to, to, to have to force you through that. Okay. Okay, so you should get something like this. And, and there's some elements of it that are a little bit rough around the edges, but I think you should be able to... Um, to see a fully functional model. Um, who needs TA help? TA help? No one? Okay. So I'm just going to run the baseline for this model. Um, you've seen the model already as Bryce showed it, um, and I'm not going to dwell on elements of, of uh, model design um, so much as elements of model implementation. In other words, how it's how it's captured, and less uh, why we we made certain choices in the hackathon that gave rise to this model. Um, this is a model that's uh, uh, situated in GIS space, and we'll see um, individuals at various stages of hypertension risk indicated um, in moving around. Um, but my goal here is to actually look down at an individual level. Okay and particularly to talk a little bit about some of the constructs used in defining this model and to talk about how we use those in their meaning. So there's two particular things I want to draw attention to. I just double clicked on person and I see the state charts that Bryce uh, showed us visually. Um, for example, um, a hypertension um, state chart and, and damage from hypertension, uh, di diagnosis related factors, uh, education factors, behavior change, smoking. And as discussed before, there are these arrows between them that inter in indicate interaction. So for example, someone's weight might affect their activity levels, but their activity level in turn affects their weight. Um, uh, or someone smoking might affect their activity level due to um, uh, limits on their uh, vasculature uh, and, and lung, lung issues. So um, we see these state charts laid out here. 
And I want to draw attention to a couple things. Um, with respect to these state charts, you'll notice that um, we have a number of state charts. Um, they are grouped thematically um, associated with certain areas in ways that use uh, any logic elements uh, to group them. So for example, there's this um, uh, grouping uh, around these components associated with hypertension and hypertension damage. Uh, there's another element uh, here around the diagnosis area, okay? Uh, so um, here, uh, we have kind of grouped, uh, grouped them according to elements, and if we went into the palette area of any logic, one thing that you could find is that there are, within the palette, rounded rectangles that you can drag in this sort of way to group things here. And I believe that's what was used here to, to kind of thematically group them. In short, they're grouped in a way that's not really a functional, um, it's, it's not um, operational, but it's, it's aesthetics and it communicates something. My focus here, though, is going to be on some of the elements of which these state charts represent. I had mentioned yesterday that a state chart represents, um, for a particular concern uh, that an agent may have, it represents a set of possibilities. These are categorical possibilities. Sometimes they're ordinal you know, higher levels of damage, pre, mild, moderate, severe. Often they are categorical or nominal. Um, so for example, someone might be in a, uh, a, a state of um, at home or at work or never smoking, current smoking, former smoking. A state chart captures therefore the states with respect to these concerns, or the, the possible states with respect to these concerns the possible situation the person can be in or the agent can be in with respect to these con particular concern represented by state chart. It represents actions that change those concerns and it represents rules by which those actions uh, occur. One of the elements is this entry. And so what this is saying is when a person comes in here, they are, all the people in this model right now are starting either in a never smoking or current smoking state, which is interesting. I would have expected some to start as former smokers. Um, in uh, behavior change, there are some people in um, this action state, some people in this preparation, contemplation, pre-contemplation. We can tell this because we have this entry and actually some can start in maintenance state. So you come in here at the top and uh, you can be divided up into all these different states. Okay, um, so this is a branch that sort of divides you up according to different possibilities. Um, now, uh, this is one aspect of actions. Um, it, it places you in, or it's, it's actually for initial state, that one. But the, um, the transitions between these states, these possible states, someone could be in with respect to this condition, indicate changes actions that change it. And you'll notice that each of them is an icon. And if we were to pull up the properties window, which I believe is a, a hidden over here. Oh, it's not there. Okay, that's fine. I'll just go turn it on. View properties. Um, one thing I'll notice if I select these things, there we go. I'm going to select one of these transitions. There's a rate associated with it. And uh, this may, um, this is a uh, uh, a rate involving hypertension progression and various effects of other risk factors on that progression. So each of these transitions has, it's an action, it changes state. It's a, an action that depends on the current state because you can only undertake this transition if you're in the pre-hypertension state. And moreover, um, there are rules by which the govern it. In this case, they set the hazard rate, okay? The hazard rate associated with it. Now, I'd like to talk about the different types of hazards in detail. And for that, I'm actually gonna ask you to bear with me while we build up a little model, okay? Um, but um, 
I want to highlight that there are different types of transitions. And we're going to come back to that to build up that model. One type of transition is this hazard rate transition. Just a certain chance per unit time of going from one state to another with respect to this in the state chart. That does not have to be a fixed probability. For example, if someone ages, the chance of them developing mild hypertension from prehypertension might rise. And so often these hazard rates will be changing. The hazard rates might change based on the presence of this person in a different state of another state chart altogether. So maybe a person's in a smoking state, for example, uh, over here with respect to smoking, and maybe that would end up um, uh, worsening my chance of developing mild hypertension because of um, impacts on arterial, um, uh, arterial damage associated with it. So what I'm saying is these hazard rates are not necessarily fixed quantities. They're quantities that could depend on, for example, me being a smoker. It could depend on how long I've been a smoker. It could depend on my age. Or it could depend on other aspects of my risk factors. But um, at any given time, my chance, little bit of time, say a day, I have a certain chance of going from this state to that state. If I'm in this state already, I have a certain chance of progressing to that one. That's what that hazard rate is, is dictating, a certain probability per unit time. That's one type of transition between states. Another type is indicated with this. It's a little question mark, no damage to low damage. This is a conditional transition. So here, I will go from no damage to low damage if my exposure exceeds a certain value. So we're keeping track of exposure to hypertension at some level. And at some point, there's going to be enough exposure to hypertension, I accrue damage. And I, I go on here, OK? That's, th that's what's indicated here with these question marks. It's a conditional one. And in Chen Yang's model, for which we've all been waiting, um, and we'll be uh, seeing her DIP model, for example, someone's clinical characterization as now being a, a diabetic will depend on their underlying level of, of uh, glycemia and a prevailing level of glycemia. Um, so that's a second type of transition in any logic. It's a conditional transition. And you can set it to depend on conditions that are checked. And when it reaches a certain situation, it will transition. A third type of transition, which is very common, is shown in many places here. It's this timeout transition, OK? Um, and, and that's a transition which occurs after some determined amount of time. Um, confusingly, often it's used with a constant. And I'm, I'm looking for other examples where it appears in a compelling way. Unfortunately, I don't Cine right here, but um, this is one which might be a little bit more confusing, but I'll mention it. So every one month, we're accruing, we're keeping track of someone's exposure, okay? So we're, we're sort of saying, oh, they've still got bad hypertension. We're going to remember that, they're, that they've been accruing this, and so their exposure level gets incremented. So every so often, and it's set as the timeout, exactly that amount of time, this transition will fire. And you can set it um, to be a time unit of your choice. Okay? Um, so commonly, it's, it's a constant. But sometimes we draw it from a distribution, the value here. And we can use it, therefore, to, to capture an arbitrary distribution um, amount of time before something happens. But most of the ways that are used in any logic in models in practice tends to be for things that are constant. That's the most common use, so I'll just put it that way. Um, so the most prevailing use of them. So this, in contrast to, a, so with a, a hazard rate, you have a certain chance per day. How soon you go is a matter of a dice roll. Here, if you have a fixed time uh, associated with a timeout transition, you'll go in exactly that amount of time. For example, if there's a uh, condition in which you're um, following an operation, you're reliably kept for a certain amount of time under sedation and then let go, you might use a timeout transition 
to let you go out. Finally, I will note that there is this transition for this model, actually there's going to be two more. There's another transition, which is this message transition. And I mentioned that before. Does anyone remember where I mentioned this sort of transition? I have a question, Nate. Yeah. Where are the, the one you were just talking about, the, This guy. Where are they going? Are they they're, they're staying in the <laughs> same state. And this is why I said, uh, okay, I got it. I don't want to show you that. So they're staying in the same state. They're actually not changing state. But it's used to do something periodically. This is kind of an instrumental uh, factor that periodically, every one month, it's doing something. It's like time to make the donuts, you know. Uh, every one month, I'll keep track of the growing exposure. My cumulative exposure will be, will be added to. So if you didn't have that end, they would still stay in the same state, but you can do that cumulative Yeah, you wouldn't be accumulating that. This is kind of a, a way of of getting it every month to record some new uh, factor. Now, the, <laughs> the fact is, if I had anything to do with it, um, I would have done that differently. But, um, um, and, and you wouldn't be asking confusedly about it. Um, so, so there's a better way to do this. But my students didn't ask. That, that's fine. That's fine. That's why you have five teams going independently or what have you. Because collectively, they can do things I can't do. And collectively, the more. They're more um, creative than I am, but sometimes we miss opportunities for mentorship. Um, so, so, so I wouldn't have done this this way. I would have kept track of when you entered the state, and then when you leave it, and would have taken the difference. And then you don't have to do time to make the donuts every month. But uh, that that could be uh, anyway. There's arguments that can be made. Wait, wait is a mature model, and you can uh, could argue back about certain factors. In any case. Um, so they're not going anywhere. And you do see these self-transitions. They're not unique. It, there's another one here, for example. Um, for example, if this one place this is often used, which you folks will have plenty of chance to see if you're interested, is for contagion. So if I'm in an infective state, I may infect other people. Maybe you know, a certain number of times per day I have contact with others. That doesn't change me from being infective, but you know, a certain number of times per day, I want to represent the fact that I'm tr like potentially transmitting to someone. And so within the infective state, I might have this transition that fires a certain number of times per, per day, say, you know, 10 times per day. But I actually don't leave. I just stay in that state. So it, yeah, enough said. Uh, it, it works. Uh, and it's kind of the preferred way of doing things, but it's, it, what it lacks in finesse, it, it gains in utility. Um, so, um, good question. The final type of, uh, or oh, I started to speak about this transition. Anyone remember what this is, this little envelope thing? Sorry? Message. Yeah, it's a message transition. Basically, is an indication that somewhere else in the model, there's something that's saying, you know, you will do this. It's like you will switch to a medication adherent state, or you will become diagnosed. And often that's an indication that um, another agent's involved, or another state chart's involved. So in this case, to go from undiagnosed to diagnosed, a given person transitioning from undiagnosed to diagnosed, are, do you have an inkling there might be another agent type in the model that might be involved in that? A, a doctor, a physician, would be involved in making this happen. And so when you have that sort of contingency that somewhere else in the model something is going to happen that's going to need to lead to a change here, we often put these message transitions. Um, I would note that some of these things you know, are, 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 are a little bit peculiar to any logic, but some of these things carry across. And this whole issue of using what are called messages to communicate between agents is a big deal in agent-based modeling. That's kind of how we have agents communicate, is mostly via messages. They send each other a message. They say, thou art now infected, or you, know, you have been exposed, or you know, I am influencing you, or, or you, know, um, you, will, uh, you will now become my service dog, or something like that. And it says, 
know, jumps into my lap. Um, <laughs> well, we, we got to add those sound effects, Jenna. But um, you get the point. Um, so, um, so there's one more type of transition, which I think may be in this model. If it's not, it's in one of the other models we browsed. Um, where is uh, movement Wade um, or Bryce? Um, movement patterns. Um, down. It's down. Okay. Down under? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, there's this transition that looks like a flag at some sort of NASCAR event or something. Um, so there's a flag that looks like this with these kind of um, these kind of checker checkerboard patterns in it. That indicates someone has arrived. So when someone commutes to work, they will be commuting until such a time they arrive at work, in which case they'll begin work. So that's what that flag means. It's an indication that this transition will occur when they arrive at their destination. Okay, and, and it's under those conditions that will be taken. You'll notice here that there are some simple assumptions here. Um, and for example, going from home to commuting to work, um, that will occur uh, after a certain amount of time and uh, they will actually start going to work uh, it, w upon entry to this, they'll start moving to work, and this will, when they arrive, it'll bring them into this next state. So those are a set of transitions um, in any logic. Those fire, these encode the rules by which these transitions, which are actions, fire. Under what conditions those fire, okay? Um, now, um, I want to highlight just one or two other features of state charts as well here. You'll notice that some of these state charts have what almost look like nested components. Um, so for example, the trans-theoretical model, the stages of change components, it has this kind of uh, rounded rectangle around, that's called change, around maintenance and action. That delineates a set of states that are, in fact, have put into place the change, whether you know, in a potentially transient basis or in a maintenance basis. Or over here, for this hypertension state chart, we have a hypertensive grouping of states. And that indicates that if you're in one of these states here, you are hypertensive, okay? You're, and and if you're normal, you're not. And so this kind of delineates uh, a set of states that share car certain characteristics. These are called compound states in any logic. Um, and uh, it, they're, they're very common within these models. You'll notice this diagnosed one. Um, we have a, a set of compound state. We have a compound state here where you can be no disease or undiagnosed. Um, you can have no disease at all, or you can be undiagnosed, or you can be diagnosed, but if you're diagnosed, you can be either medication adherent or medication non-adherent. So when we have this kind of hierarchical characterization of the situation, we like to group things. Um, it, it's meaningful to want to ask, you know, is someone diagnosed or not? Putting aside whether they happen to be adherent or not, are they diagnosed? Are they known to be diagnosed? are known to have uh, hypertension. And what would qualify is that they were in either of these states, regardless of adherence. We're not asking about adherence, we're asking about diagnosis. So to capture that, we often group um, states. Um, it allows us to ask higher level questions, like count for me the number of hypertensive people in the population, without getting into the details of whether it's mild or moderate or severe, right? But we can go down to that level of desire. So at any one time, with respect to a given state chart, a person, an agent here, is in exactly one simple state. That's this kind of yellow states, or, or these most particular states at any one time. They can actually be in these compound states, these kind of hierarchical states as well. More than one of them if needed um, that group things. But they're in only one of these specific states uh, at a given time and they transition between stuff. 
Why do we group things? We group things for clarity conceptually. We group things visually to communicate with our stakeholders. We also group things because it can allow an economy of exposition in terms of um, describing shared features. Um, and I'm looking for an element in this model that would express this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's uh, very likely some, but I'm, I'm uh, growing increasingly desperate to find one. Um, uh, okay, well, um, opportunity for mentorship. Um, lady, uh, here we go. Uh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool, okay. Okay, one recognizes the lion by his claw. Um, okay, great. So here, up, up at the top, we see a dichotomous classification of individuals into whether they're seeking care or not. But we recognize that seeking care has several particular variants of that state, several substates they can be in. So they could be seeking care and um, in a state of having missed an appointment, having attended some appointment, um, or uh, attending an appointment or seeking an appointment. Um, uh, and here, you'll notice that there's one transition out from all of these. Do you see that? And what that replaces is the need to specify a transition from each and every one of these. So if they're in any of these, this will be applying. In other words, they'll have a certain chance of going to not seeking care. Um, and uh, that allows us to have an economy of exposition. We don't need to have arrows from all of these. We can just capture that um, uh, from, from, the, from any of these states by putting it from the compound state. And similarly, you could have arrows that go to this compound state. And within it, it will always go where there's this kind of little, uh, little uh, um, limit. I don't, I don't know what to call this. A limit? Uh, a dot on an arrow. Um, it'll go to the where there's this, and this is called an entry uh, uh, mumble. Um, it's uh, initial state. Initial state, yeah. Which is initial within this uh, overall compound state. Um, not to be confused with the state chart entry, which is where they'll come in initially. So they'll enter here always, everyone is entering in this model and a not seeking care. And when you look at models, you should start to look at that and say, is this, is this really what we want? We want everyone to start not care seeking, or do we want everyone to start as a non-smoker, or what have you? This is what I mean by being informed, uh, having an informed ability to read a model. If you look at it, you can read immediately, okay, this is assuming everyone is starting in a not seeking care state. Now, there may be a reason for that. Maybe they go through Later in the week, I'm hoping to talk about burn-in periods and so on. Maybe it goes through a certain amount of time. The model is run before we start having it count. Um, but in any case, um, uh, people here all start in a not seeking care state. So these compound states are useful. Um, often we'll have transitions to them as a whole or from them as a whole, and that eliminates the need for extra levels of, uh, of detail. A few other things are these branches. These are indicating conditional flow. So for example, someone might um, periodically engage in care seeking. Well, in, in this case, um, uh, they, they have a certain care seeking rate. And if it's non-zero, they'll have a certain, that as their hazard rate. Now, engaging in care seeking, there might be certain conditions under which uh, in fact, pans out. This one is actually disabled. Um, here, for example, um, and this is this diagnosis state. Um, well, I'll, I'll pick a more interesting one than that. This is just for an initial one. But uh, how about this one here? Um, right. So, for example, if someone misses an appointment um, um, uh, with a 0.5 chance, they'll go to seeking an appointment again and a 0.5 chance by implication they'll fall off the bus, fall off the truck, and they'll go to not seeking care. Where did I get that 0.5? I got it from here. So this is saying um, uh, that with this probability, 0.5, they will go 
to a state of seeking appointments. And this is the default case, this dotted arrow. So they'll, they'll stay in the, and they'll go back to this not seeking care state. So in short, if someone misses the appointment and they're not getting calls to remind them and so on, they may end up a state in a state of not seeking care. Okay, yeah. Mumble. Uh, I will have to check. I can't. I can't remember. This is a very good question, and I wondered this briefly because I didn't see the Death Star state. Um, but uh, I will ask Bryce or Wade to comment. I I don't know that there's death in this model. I believe not. I believe I believe it 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 uh, was left out. Part of the issue is is it was operating over a fairly short period of time. The time frames they were interested in were a few years, and this gets to. I mean, it's a very germane point. Um, so when it comes to model scope, one thing I didn't talk about this morning, about whether to represent things or not, one thing that affects it is the degree to which model time frame makes certain phenomena important. So for example, if you're simulating a single flu, um, uh, a single flu season, for example, um, you might not get really concerned about representing births in the population during that time. Um, because over the course of, of that outbreak, um, the number of births is not going to be so significant, it's going to materially impact the number of susceptibles in a big way. Babies aren't disproportionately hit or what have you. Um, maybe that's not the case, but that, that would be my guess. Um, Similarly, there may be models where we leave out, because of the short period of time, um, population turnover, deaths, and births. I think in this model, it was probably something that was intended to be put in, but we ran out of time. Um, there was a, and this is again an issue of opportunity costs. We were quite pushed to have this model be broader, and yes, Wade. If I may comment on that, the Please. run time is a year. It's a year. Yeah. I believe it was discussed and decided against. Okay. Okay. So we decided against putting it in. Um, it would have an obvious implication in terms of certain outcome measures if we're looking at, for example, um, factors that might also lead people to quit smoking, thereby lowering mortality rates, um, but potentially they're hypertensive. Um, uh, already, and as a result, the prevalence of hypertension may be higher, even though we've done net benefit because we've saved them from dying. So this is one of the things that can come in um, when you when you do consider deaths that it can lead to seemingly adverse changes in indicators like prevalence that are naive taken um, because you've saved lives, <laughs> and um, and and that could be an issue. But it wasn't put in. If you wanted to represent death, the way it would be done is through this state called a final state, okay? And you'll find no shortage of models in the example models which use this. And then you can set up um, transitions from different states which will go to this final state. This final state is a little bit, it may be unique among these things in the sense of being shared by multiple, by multiple state charts. A final state can be shared by multiple state charts. I didn't know that. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Yes. Um, so uh, we would capture it like that, and then in the final state, we typically say this person disappears from the model. We would make the agent um, be removed from the model population. And um, it's through a thing called remove under bar the population name. Yeah, I'd be glad to show that separately if there's interest. Okay. Um, so this is a little bit about state charts. I want people to be able to read state charts. Um, now I also want to show uh, one or two other things here involving parameters. Okay. Um, so weighted sp or Bryce had spoken um, eloquently, I might note, as is his uh, style um, about. Um, uh, about elements of this model. And if you go, if you go click in the model exploration onto person here, and you explore down and you say parameters, you'll find 
that there's a set of parameters listed together with their default values. Now their default values are given here. If you don't change them, this is what they will be. Um, uh, but in general, when we have a set of agents, we will specify the parameters for those agents where we create them. Um, and in many cases, that is in the population of agents. So we can have parameters here for agents. These uh, include things like um, the cost tolerance of an agent or, or distance tolerance. Those are preference related. Or someone's initial age or someone's initial care seeking rate um, or their sex or their SES and, and their language um, capacities. Um, these are parameters about the agent. There are assumptions made about this particular agent. And if we don't specify values, it'll use these values. But where we do specify values typically is when we create the agent. And there's basically a couple places we do that. When they're born into the population, we won't cover that quite yet. Or if you look at Maine and you expand agents, you'll find there's actually a population of agents. So there's a population here of agents in Maine. So Maine contains a population of agents, okay? And if you go to that population and you select it, what you'll find is assumptions to make about the values of the parameters for the agents. And some of these assumptions may be different than the default value. For example, from their sex, we pick randomly between two sexes with equal probability. Their SES, chooses um, uh, randomly from, uh, from possible SEX uh, categories. Um, their uh, care-seeking rate is set. The number of jobs, this is the number of jobs they're juggling. Is that right, Bryce? Number of jobs? Uh, yes. Um, so if they're working two jobs, maybe it makes them too busy to see the clinician, makes it harder to get access at an operational level. And there's a sense, and there's other assumptions being filled in. So for this particular population, we are saying, we are basically saying, make these the assumptions about the population. Some are distributions, draws from distributions, like this cost tolerance distribution. We have a, a, we have a distribution for that. Um, so when you have populations of agents, we typically have a heterogeneous population. And indeed, this is heterogeneous in sex, in SES, in, in age, in number of jobs, in cost tolerance. So their preferences for, for uh, care according to cost and maybe distance. So our populations make assumptions about the, the parameters for an agent in that population. So, so I want to emphasize something here. Parameters are used to encode the assumption and communicate that assumption from the point of where that thing is created to that thing. So in this case, it's an agent. And we use this to encode the assumptions about that agent. For example, their cost tolerance and the number of jobs that they work. And those parameters communicate from this population hey, what this agent's characteristics are. So when it gets created, it gets lent these characteristics, and that's, those, are its, those are its characteristics. Um, now, within the context of this, this same principle of parameters carries over, as it turns out, at a higher level as well, for main compared with uh, scenarios. So ladies and gentlemen, Maine also has parameters. There's parameters, assumptions about Maine. Think of parameters as assumptions, okay? They're fixed characteristics that often represent assumptions, like assumptions about this person. They, are, they have this sex, assume that they're this sex, assume that they're this, this age and this SES group, okay? It's a fixed characteristic. It's one that doesn't change over time. That's how parameters are used here. Um, it turns out Maine, the global situation, also has certain characteristics or assumptions we specify. For example, um, whether callback from pharmacists are going on 
or the effect of interventions on activity level or um, some aspect of special provider uh, setup. Oh wow, tell a story, that's really interesting. Is that, is that your creation? Yeah, and I forgot to mention that in my talk yesterday, but uh, yeah. That's really interesting. So is that accumulating like uh, history information on the agent? I believe in this model it may just print it to the console, but. Uh, I see. So printing out the aspect of the agent's story yeah. to the console. But in your model of yeah. Northern Waters. It actually keeps a record of it. it a history, a biography of that person. Yeah. OK. So um, here we have certain assumptions about the model as a whole. One of them that I'm surprised not to see here um, is uh, pop should be population. Normally, we, we will have, for Maine, one of the assumptions we make about the model is, how big is the population? And then we use that. And um, these are things about Maine that, that we need to specify. And who specifies them? The scenario. So the scenario will specify the actual assumptions to use for a particular experiment. It'll specify what to assume about the callback rate, what to assume about the intervention efficacy when it comes to the, its impact on the smoking rate, uh, what to assume about uh, uh, the population size or what have you. Um, for some reason, I don't see population size here. Wait, yeah. If you, uh, if you mm. look right below the population in Maine, yeah. there's a function called init pop. Um, uh, and it actually okay. loads the population by zip code. Oh, it loads it in by zip code. Wow. And I think I believe that's the work of the king. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was royal work. Yes. Okay. Guai guai long di dong. Um, that's that's amazing. Um, so uh, so basically, this population is loaded. Uh, that's right. According to different zip codes according to the characteristics of those zip codes, I think. So it loads it in from, from uh, some feature. And in general, agent-based models can load it in from databases, can load it in from you know, some files. Um, you could read them in in principle from administrative data or cohort um, descriptions. Um, there's some special considerations when this agent corresponds to this person in the world but it is perfectly possible. And in this case, it does it on a zip code by zip code basis to have a right balance of population, I guess, across different zip codes. So in short, parameters encode assumptions. And we can apply parameters at a, an agent level, in which case we specify them where the agents get created, which in, in most common places in the population in, the, in Maine, that's sort of the the context for those agents. We specify for these agents, use these assumptions. Maybe we have two cities of agents, two populations. Each population, we specify certain characteristics. Maybe the demographics is different. But for Maine as a whole, that context, we specify its ass the assumptions about it in the, base, in the um, scenarios, okay? Scenarios. Okay, so this is a little bit of introduction to some essentials of, of uh, any logic modeling. I would like now to illustrate these in a quite uh, visceral way um, at the cost of, of potentially um, boring you. I'd, I'd just like to, to make sure that you're clear on these distinctions. And we won't spend long in this. There'll be much more opportunity to go deeper for those who would like to do so at a different session. But um, I would like to walk you through seeing what you do when you create a model involving these things, okay? Um, recognizing not everyone is gonna become a modeler, but this will help you be a more informed consumer of modelers, of models, okay? Um, so what I'd like to do here is to, um, go and uh, close down this model. So if you go up here and you say close all, um, uh, that will, will close up this model. And we're going to actually create our first little model here, okay? 
There we go. Um, okay. So you should have a blank canvas. The world, ladies and gentlemen, is yours to paint. And I'd like now to create a model. I want to remove the mystery of what's involved in this, because you've been looking at kind of models as monolithic things. Let's make it more concrete. But more to the point, I want to illustrate how these things work at a, at a, at a connected way so that you'd be empowered to, to, to understand them better at the least. So I'd like you to do file, new, model. OK, now TAs, high alert. This is like code red. OK, um, this is not a test. This is not a test. This is, <laughs> OK. So um, uh, I would like to create a model. This is, um, uh, uh, let's call um, uh, heterogeneous, hetero, heterogeneous population. Um, and uh, when you do that, you have to choose a model time unit. Uh, I'd like to choose, uh, if I could, years, if, if, if I may, OK? Um, so we're going to choose a time unit. This is just a yardstick. It's, it's not um, in certain packages like, um, uh, like NetLogo or Repass. The normal situation for age-based modeling historically has been you, you advance time in what are called ticks. Okay? Um, and it's not ticks in a, in, a, in a health context. It's ticks in a context of... Um, you know, particular TikToks of a clock, okay? And each TikTok within those frameworks is, is kind of, um, the model advances in lockstep. It goes from one tick to the next to the next. And some models leave kind of unspecified what a tick represents. Is it a month or is it a week? Um, and yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> my students like my animation. Um, uh, so, so that model has some, um, it is, it's, it's very common, it's, it's, it's the most common model. But a growing number of packages, in fact, um, support a model that is quite a bit easier to reason about and um, where you're less likely to run into trouble. The problem with ticks, ladies and gentlemen, of this sort, not Lyme disease sort, um, those, are those are problematic too, for different reasons. Um, the problem with ticks of this sort um, is that if you're handling the model advancing in lockstep from one time to another, please students pay attention to this. I may test you on it. Um, uh, no, seriously, you've got to know this, like if you're doing agent-based modeling. The problem with ticks is that when you deal with the model as a whole advancing some amount, a lot of things have to occur uh, on account of that advance. Different types of processes, like maybe someone, uh, some people get married, some people uh, are born, some people die, um, some individuals develop, contract the disease. And when you try to reason about the, the outputs on the basis of this, you end up running into these kind of messy issues, like, okay, we want to calculate how many people developed a disease. Do we do we remove the people who die first? You know, if we want to calculate incident case counts over the past years, um, do we first consider taking away from the population those that have died and don't even consider those in the incident case counts? Or do we calculate first the incident cases and then, and we record those, and then the people that died? Well, which occurred first, dying for a person or, or they would have developed the disease before? they died or after. And you get into these issues of kind of which one goes first that are messy. And one of the things that people have found with models of that sort is the results can sometimes change dramatically what order you do things. So if you do death before considering cases of incident, um, incident uh, uh, cases of disease, the results may be actually rather different than vice versa. And to really rigorously handle this, it gets messy, because you're ending up brokering, figuring out which occurred first, and considering that in your calculations. And it's, 
it's, it's nasty, awkward, needless stuff. So what AnyLogic does, together with a number of other platforms, um, Repass now offers this capacity, I believe. So does, um, so does some micro simulation packages where I think it's the standard. Is they offer what's called continuous time. And what this means is things happen at their natural times. You don't have to worry about does this occur before that. If it happens to occur before, it occurs before. If it happens to occur after, and you don't have to worry about post hoc figuring out at the end of the year which occurred first. Did he die first to develop that disease to figure out you know, whether you count him as having an incident case? You don't have to worry about the ordering of things explicitly. It takes care of all of that. So it uses a continuous time model. Time moves as quickly or as slowly as it needs to to allow all the different things to occur. And you can have some things which occur very quickly like say in an outbreak, and then some things which occur only very infrequently, and it takes care of that. You don't have to pick a time unit that's small enough, or time step that's small enough to, to get the, the finest grain of time. So you're picking here, when you create a model, you're picking a time unit. You're not picking a tick length. Ticks, you generally don't have to worry about in any law. If you want to use ticks, you can use ticks. But I consider that about at the same level as wanting a tick of my body of the physical sort. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like ticks of either sort. I, I, I find them both equally unpleasant. Um, okay, so any logic makes use of continuous time. Repast offers that option. OpenM and ModGen offer a similar abstraction. And uh, as a modeler who's used both a lot, I've used Repast quite a lot, I've used NetLogo, et cetera. I will tell you, life is so much better in the continuous time world. So we're gonna be using continuous time here. And you won't even know that, how much your grief you're avoiding, um, trust me. Okay, so we just, we just opened a model. Now, um, this model, when we created it, it goes by our name, um, but we, it's a blank slate. It's a world unto itself, and it's waiting for us to create it. Um, we can run it. If, if we want to do so, we could run our model, but it will be kind of a singularly uninteresting thing to run. Um, here, I'm going to run it, and, and you, you can't even tell it's running, but if I go open this, I could see, oh, look, seven years have passed, <laughs> eight years have passed. <laughs> this is a really th simple theory about the world, ain't it? But the world is... The world has nothing in it. It's, it's, all, it's all nothing there. Okay, let's do something better than that. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go and add in a theory of personhood, okay? Um, a person, a, a, we're gonna call it a person. It's, this is important, this is why I do these things, to teach some of these lessons even just as a model consumer, you really need to know. We want to represent a theory of personhood. What it means to be a person in this model. A personness. And we do so by creating what's called a person class. Okay? Um, it, it delineates personhood. And there'll be many instances of this class. Um, uh, but the class will sort of summarize what it means to be a person how they vary, they have an age, they have a sex, they have an income, that sort of thing. And, um, and we will uh, use that then to, um, uh, to, to uh, go and uh, explore some of these, these features. So we're going to add to this model uh, a, a class here, okay? Um, we do new and we do agent type. It looks like uh, Da Vincian measure of man. It says agent type, okay? And I'm going to call it person with a capital P. We generally, we generally use a capital letters to, uh, to indicate this. Um, and uh, I will go and say finish, okay? Um, okay, um, great. So I've just added a person. Now this person has a theory of personhood that's also singularly simple. 
There ain't nothing there. Let's at least give them something. Let's give them the dignity of a faith, shall we not? I'll tell you, I'll share with you that uh, while we're adding this, that some of my students played a trick on me a number of years ago. It was upwards of 10 years ago. And they, when they created their agents, they put my face on it. <laughs> and they had this model running where it had me, you know, many copies of me. Um, <laughs> enough that they could meet with it every day um, for consulting, um, uh, for mentorship. Um, okay. Um, anyway, um, so ladies and gentlemen, we, we're going to go to our palette again, and we're going to go to this area that says, um, should, we do, should we do this for a presentation? Yeah, let's do presentation, okay. Um, and what I'd like to do here is to um, go drag in an oval, okay? It's an oval. Um, how did I do that? I went to this presentation palette. It looks like a set of platonic shapes. And if you click on that and you can drag in from an oval and we'll give each person a, a nice oval, okay? Um, there they are, they have an oval. Now, I'd like to make that oval a little less big. So I'm, I'm well, okay, I could just keep it, keep it here and I wanna show the properties menu here. Um, and I'll do appearance, oh sorry, position and size, and I'll change its size to be, its radius to be 10. How did I do that? How did I do that? I went to the palette, I went up and down here, okay, um, and I just dragged from oval over here to person, and then I, I clicked on this oval in person, and I made it, and I, I when I got it into the properties window. If you don't see properties, use view properties to see it. And then I opened position and size and I chose 10 as the radius, okay? TAs, um, can, we, can we get uh, a TA over in the center area? Um, because there's a imbalance between TA location and participant location. There's a, almost a segregation due to slight preferences. I, which side, I won't speculate. Uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I just changed this to be that size. Now, we have a theory of personhood that is stylized in the extreme. People are represented by what? What do people have to their name? A circle, yeah, an oval. Well, it's better than nothing, right? Um, now we could run this model, we still wouldn't see anything because we have a theory of person, of, but there is nobody in our model. There are no people in our model. We have a theory of what it means to be a person's, but there are no persons there. In order to create that, we need a population of people. So I'm trying to distinguish here between a class which specifies a theory of personhood. We're gonna give income, sex, it's great. But separate from that is the need for pretty good people. And those are two different things. You can have a theory of personhood without particular people around. So I'd like to go to Maine. Go back, now note where you are. You're right now in person. That's what we gave an oval. We're gonna go back to Maine. Remember the Maine. Um, go back to Maine and we're gonna go down Maine, okay? Um, and we're going to drag in from person to main, okay? And this very action of dragging from person to main is going to create the option of a population. So I'm, how did I do that? I went to main, I went down main, and I dragged person in here, okay? Um, okay, uh, population, okay? I guess no one here is from New England, as you might recognize. So does yeah. Maine represent the world? Maine represents the world. It represents the context. It represents the global situation. Oh, okay. It represents, the best way to say it is probably context in which agents will be operating. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what we, um, uh, that's what we're going to be representing. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Is that any... 
restriction on that we place it? We can place it anywhere in the country? You can place it anywhere. Uh, there's no restriction. It has no, uh, it has no significance except aesthetically it's, if, if, you, if you place it here, for example, it may get in the way of, this is valuable screen real estate because this is the part of the window that will be showing when the model comes up and you might feel it's, it's getting in the way of you seeing valuable things here. And so sometimes I drag it up. But what happened is, so good question, but in terms of how the model runs, it has no, no bearing, okay? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I dragged in person to Maine but here, I'm not done yet. I want to go to, the po I called it population, but I actually need to make it a population of agents over here in properties. Right now, it was single agent. I want to change it to population of agents, okay? Okay, now, right now, for ease of, of just showing this, I will leave it as uh, a population with 100 agents, okay? And, um, it knows which agents they are because I drag from person. In general, we'll have more than one theory of agenthood. Like maybe we'll have persons and service dogs, or maybe we'll have physicians and patients, or maybe we'll have homes and, and um, uh, clinicians and uh, population members. Um, different models will have different populations of agents, okay? Uh, here, a given population will be all one type of agent. Here, it's all persons. So let's go run this model, shall we not? Let's go run it. See what happens. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. And here it is. And I'm going to press this button here. And, okay, we see a population. If you actually click on that population. Oh, man, this thing is annoying. Um, um, you'll see there's actually a list of people there. And you'll see this kind of single, single thing. It's a single circle. Guess what that represents? All 100 people on, atop each other. Okay, that, that isn't that, that isn't that interesting. Um, uh, let's go see if we can make it more interesting. If you go to the population back in Maine, um, you notice that you can specify where people occur, are, are placed here, okay? You can specify there to appear at a certain place, um, at a certain location, a specific location, at, uh, at, at certain specified locations, etc. Now there's two ways that uh, we can deal with this. Um, one way is that in Maine itself, ladies and gentlemen, you can actually define uh, associated with, uh, uh, with Maine, uh, you can define the size of this space and you can actually say in Maine, because the population lives in Maine, I'm gonna go to Maine and I might say, I want a layout of a random layout. And for our purposes right now, I'm gonna select that, okay? So how did I do this? I went to Maine, that's sort of the context as a whole, and I'm gonna go down over here in the properties, and I'm gonna to go to space and network, and I'm going to say the layout type is going to be a random layout. I could also say a ring, in which case all the agents will be will be placed in a ring, as if they're dancing around the maypole. Okay, so I said a random layout. Um, you can place them in an array, etc. So I'm gonna say run here. And, and now we have them appearing all around the screen. How did I do that? What did I do? Well, in case you didn't follow, in Maine we have this population. When we ran it last time, all of them appeared, but they appeared atop each other. And so what I did is I went to Maine, I went, I went down Maine to Space and Network, and I selected a layout type of random. And we ran it, and we saw them laid out in a visual way, okay? Here we go, they're laid out 
all around. Here are our agents. There are our agents. How many of them are there? 100. 100. Count them. Um, yeah, you can see the size here. 100 people, okay? Um, so the two, uh, two circles, red circles? Uh, yeah. What are they? Like they are just assigned? Yeah, it's a good question for population. Why there's two red circles? Uh, <laughs> mumble. Um, I haven't seen that in previous demos, uh, previous boot camps. Um, any, hey, TAs, anyone want to hazard a guess? Yes, Wade. It's because the shift to this Chromium UI, now the icon for the population has two circles. Oh, okay, so that's the when official icon for the population. If, if it were a single agent, I believe it would I see. Okay. So it's actually the way of characterizing a population of agents visually. And this is a result of a switch they just made in, like, in the past half year or so to Chromium, which is, yeah. You know, so anyway. they're not part of the, the agents, right? They're not. And, and, and this is what got in the way. This is, I was, I was asking, you know, when I was asked, where do you place that? Some people like to place it just up here so that it won't, oh. get, it, it won't, it won't appear in the midst of the display. Um, you can put it just up above, and then, then you can scroll up and see it, but it won't get in the way of this, if you see what I mean. So that's also possible, um, and, and you can do that. Um, it turns out if you want to move this around, um, you can actually change the location at which it, it, it displays things. That's kind of the... The, the location of, of uh, where it starts displaying these things. Oh, okay. That was, they changed that in versions of any logic. Okay. So, in previous versions, if you change that, it would actually change where it's displayed, but evidently. There's a, there's a check okay. that says draw agent with offset to this position. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, got it. Okay. Uh, somewhere here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so anyway, we have a population of agents that are shown. These popul this population of agents is currently entirely homogenous, right? They're entirely the same. They all look identical. Their only difference is their location. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now go and set some characteristics so that they can differ from each other, okay? So that we actually have some differences between the different, um, uh, the different agents. Okay, um, so what I'd like to do here is um, uh, I would like to go and lend a person a little bit more texture than simply having a having a, a circle, I'd like to give them an income, okay? Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we will go to the palette and we will go, instead of to this presentation area, we will go to this uh, agent area, okay? And I'm going to drag in to person. How would I associate each person with a fixed, Pop, uh, fixed income. What would I give them? Would I give it a state? I would give it a par parameter. It's an assumption about them. Okay. Um, so this, I'm going to drag in from this area parameter, and I'm going to call it income. Okay. Now. We're going to come to a set of guidelines um, here. I'm going to give them an income. And um, when I drag it in, I'll give them, I'll say I'll give them an income by default of, um, of, of $10,000, okay? 10,000, uh, mind you, uh, Canadian dollars, um, okay? Um, uh, okay, so I just gave everyone an income, they all have a characteristic of an income. Don't be too caught away with this default value. That's if I just don't specify it somewhere. If I leave it blank, it'll fill that in. This is their 
default income only in the sense that I'll have lots of opportunities to specify. If I don't specify, this is what it is. Most of the time, I'll specify it. And I said to you earlier, parameters serve to encode the assumption about the agent, but also to communicate it from where the point of creation of the agent. So who's responsible in this model for creating persons? Where do the persons live? They live in a what? It begins with a P. It ends with an N. It has a second P in it. Population. It's a population that specifies the assumptions about the persons in it. If I have a population for Saskatoon, it'll have different characteristics of the demographics of that population than a, uh, uh, the population associated with Fort McMurray or associated with, um, uh, with Victoria, BC. Um, so here, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we have per theory of personhood includes having some income. What particular assumptions we're making about a particular people is specified by the population of those people. So if we go back to Maine, remember the population lives in Maine. Mm -hmm. And if we go to that population, now we'll see that actually there's, not only do we specify the number of agents, but we specify some, some income for those agents. It says 10,000. But we want a heterogeneous population. So let's make it a draw from a random distribution. So I'm going to type in log normal. It's going to be a draw, a draw from a log normal distribution, OK? Um, with a log mean, a, a mu, for the log normal distribution, for those familiar with it, um, for to be 10.0, a sigma, a log standard deviation of 3, and a minimum value overall of 0. OK? OK. OK? Mm. OK, uh, here, I can make this bigger. Yeah, would that be helpful? I can, I can make it? OK, awesome. Um, so here we go. Let me, let me see if I can make this um, uh, uh, bigger. Uh, TAs, can you um, uh, mumble? Uh, I've been done this for a couple of years. Um, um, or, um, uh, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll use my fallback technique. I will put it up on here. Um, I'll, I'll do this. There we go. There we go. Is that OK? OK. Oh, one step too far. Um, OK. A draw from a log normal distribution. OK? This is basically saying, for each person, let their income be this draw from the log normal distribution. Each person will be lent a different income. They'll have a different draw. For each person, this will be what's undertaken to set their income. Before it was a fixed value, 10,000. Now it's this. By the way, I'll make this 0.0, because that's the minimum. Um, in general, it's good uh, to use, um, to be precise, what do you mean? A double precision value, mention it, because otherwise weird things can happen when you divide things um, by integers. And let's not get into that right now. Um, glad to hold forth on it if there's a time. OK, so now we're giving people different incomes. OK? Let's run the model. Are we ready? Who needs a bit more time? You notice I put these parentheses. These parentheses give log normal this is what's called a function or a method. It gives it all the information it needs to do its job. Like in high school, you'd write, you know, sine of sine of 45 degrees, um, uh, or or um, or you know, sine of two pi or what have you. Um, we we put the thing the the things that it needs to do its job in parentheses. Here, what it needs to do its job is three values, the log mean, the mu, 
the log standard deviation, the sigma, and a minimum value. That's the information it needs to do its job. And they're called, confusingly, arguments. Okay? Um, uh, so this is the information it needs to do its job. And it's going to return a value that's going to be their income. So can we run the model? Let's run the model, if we may. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Okay, um, so here we have our population, here we have people, and they don't look particularly distinguished, but let's go, does anyone remember, how can we see the characteristics of these people? I've shown you a few times before, how can I see it? Yeah, you go to this thing, and you can drill down to see your population, and take a look at this one. So this individual is well healed. Um, this other person has a sizable income to their name. Um, I noted these were in Canadian dollars. Maybe those first two will make you want to move to Canada. But, um, but you know, the third one is, is a person of, of little means, and, and uh, the fourth one even more so. So now we have some heterogeneity among people, okay? Let's make this a little bit clear by making their shape different, okay? Um, let's, let's lend them a, a different shape. And then we'll be moving on to state charts here, okay? Um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you go and you go to this to this icon in person, excuse me, in person. Always be clear about where you're doing this. In person, you'll notice this oval. Um, this oval has a set of characteristics, okay? Um, and one of the characteristics for person is you can set the radius. In fact, when we created this, I went and I set the radius. Do you remember that? I went and I clicked and I set the radius. Okay, who needs TA help? The TAs are circulating. TAs should be circulating. There's an imbalance. The, the, a sector one is entirely made up of TAs. So I'd like some sector one TAs to migrate to sector two, OK? Um, in order to make sure that all the participants are well supported. OK? OK. So. Um, Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go in person to this oval and we're going to set the radius of each person to be based on their, guess what? Income. Okay. <laughs> Have you been watching some videos? Um, There's only one character. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. Okay. Okay. You know where this is going. Great. Great. I admire your paying attention. Um, I wish all my TAs would do that sometimes. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, radius. The problem is we'd like to say income, but you'll notice it will, it gives problems if we say that. It says invalid number. So what we have to do, this is a little piddly thing. Thank you, Jason. Um, we actually have to click this equal side and turn it to, uh, until it's this little recalculation sign. And then we can say, make this based on my income, okay? Okay, but we don't want to do it based on income directly because a million income will be, would leave so <laughs> a, a, a giant thing. So we'll base it on the log. So we'll do log of the income plus one times 2.0. I'll put this up on the big screen. There we go. There we go. Okay? And actually, we should make this 1.0. Uh, okay, now I... Um, so it's, it's plus 1.0 times 2.0. Okay? Mm. You'll be safe if you use the decimal reliably. If you don't use the decimal, it'll probably be fine in the vast majority of cases. But someday, sitting in your office you will rue the fact because you will be sure that this is non-zero 
but it turns into a zero because it, it says you want to divide three by four as integers, fine, it's zero. It's integer division. And you'll say it should be 75% of the population that's the initial prevalence, and it's zero, why? And if only you had practiced decimal hygiene, you would have you would have been safe. But if you want to play fast, if you want to go close to the edge, you can do so. And the truth is, most of my students do, but occasionally they come to me and they say, it won't work. I say, show me, show me. Where's the decimal point? And they, they go back. They learn, okay? Hopefully they learn. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, as they say in China, the old horse knows the way. Um, okay, uh, so here we go. Log of income plus one times 2.0, okay? There we go, 1.0. So let's, let's go run this. And what will we see now? Anyone, anyone want to hazard a guess? Okay, now, oh. who are these big ones? These are the ones that are wealthy. Who are the small ones? Those that are of lower SES, right? And we can go and we can actually drill through the, the people in the population and you'll actually see their sizes. This person has a big size. This person has a somewhat smaller size. Some of these later ones will have smaller sizes yet. Um, so it gives you a sense of their size. The old Danny logic used to show them in position, which was kind of sweet, but um, in any case, uh, you can you can click on this and um, and go through the population members. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we have a heterogeneous population. This is great. We've lent, we've seen a distinction between having a theory of personhood and having individual people. We've lent a population of people. That population has certain characteristics which we can impose upon the theory of personhood. These are all persons, but they differ in their particulars. And remember when I introduced ABM, I said, in ABM, you have, you have a characterization of a theory of person, and then you have particular people who are different variants of it. This is how it's achieved, okay? This is basically the pattern which we use, a model after model after model after model. Um, virtually every model you will see that I've given to you has this pattern in it. You have a population, you have people, they have some characteristics, you have a population of people and they differ, and that specifies how the people differ in their characteristics. That's it, okay? Um, okay, so this is nice, but a theory of personhood, as a theory of personhood, this still falls flat. flat. After all, it lacks any change. We're, we're doing dynamic modeling here, but this is a static model, is it not? A model um, with no change in it whatsoever. People have an income, and that's it, right? Um, let's add a little bit of dynamics. And this is where, again, teaching lessons here. I want you to be able to interpret these models. So I'm teaching you some principles about how they're organized. I'm not trying to turn all of you into to any logic modelers, but I'm trying to teach some principles that carry cross platforms. And this distinction between a class of people, a theory of personhood, and, and particular people is one that carries across most, most platforms for agent-based modeling. Let us now go to person and let's lend them some behavior, if I may. If, ladies and gentlemen, I may. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to go to personhood and I am going to put into a person a state chart entry point. Okay, um, and this state chart entry I found in this agent palette, and I dragged in state chart entry, and uh, you'll notice that it labels it. Uh, it labels it as state chart. I'm going to rename that. I'm going to say smoking state chart. Okay, um, smoking state chart. Sometimes I leave the name state chart. Often I do so I know what it is from its name. Um, I know what sort of thing I'm dealing with. If I just called it smoking, it would be uh, blunt. Um, and um, 
And so this is a, a smoking state chart, okay? Okay. Um, and now, what do we need for the state chart beyond just it? Beyond just showing um, uh, this, uh, this, this entry point, what else do we need? Anyone? State. Yeah, we need a state, ladies and gentlemen. We need a state, okay? Um, so, we are going to add in a state which is going to be, we're going to drag it in, and we're going to make, try to make it so it connects with this guy. It's going to be called Never Smoker, okay? Um, and make sure this thing is connected to it. So if you click up there, it should have a little green blibbit, uh, a small blibbit that connects it with the state chart, um, okay? With this first state. So, so there's only one state. There's only one possibility they can be in. When they come in, they're going to be an ever smoker. So that ain't that interesting. Um, it's kind of like a subway line with a single stop, right? So in Boston, um, uh, you know, there's there's uh, one of those subway uh, stops. Uh, Park Street has a commemorative plaque. It says this was the first subway stop, and often. I would go there and wonder what it was like to ride the subway when it was just one stop, you know? <laughs> I guess you can go around in circles or something. something. Um, uh, uh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, smoking state chart. We're gonna have to, to have any meaningful change, we're going to need to have two states. So let's go create a state, it's gonna be called current smoker, okay? Current smoker, okay? How did I do this? Um, well, remember I'm in this, this agent state chart. I dragged up the entry point. I renamed it the smoking state chart. I dragged in this one to become never smoker state and I made sure they were connected by making sure this is a, a green color. This is green is the color and state charts are the game. Okay, so now you drag in a state here that's called current smoker, okay? Now, this is all nice and good. We have two possible states, but what are we missing? We're missing an action, yeah, an arrow between them, a transition between them. Ladies and gentlemen, let us add said arrow. So we're gonna add an arrow, and oh, I happen to line it up so that it connected, but maybe you miss. Um, which is fine, I mean, I, I uh, often don't connect it at first. Let me get rid of this and pretend I missed. Hey, come on. Um, okay, uh, so suppose I dragged it in and I didn't connect it. You can pull at this and connect it here, and you can pull at that. Look, even if you're not gonna build models, you might want to be able to modify them in, in um, artful ways. If you had someone working with you to build a model, maybe you have someone like Wade to build a model or Narges or someone like Jenna or Young. You, you have them working with you, but maybe you want to be able to modify it. And so this teaches you some principles about doing that. Okay, so here, here we have a timeout of one. One what? Well, if you look over, it's one years. Where did it get this years from? It's the time unit of the model. Now, that doesn't mean everything occurs in lockstep. Things occur whenever they do. But by default, it just says, hey, one, whatever the time unit is, I'll make it. Okay, this is great. So now we have people, they can be in an ever smoking state and a current smoking state. Ladies and gentlemen, if we may, let's run the model now. Can we do that? Run or not? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's go to the model. And I would like to run simulation. And remember, build, er, like, Build it early, run it early, run it often. <laughs> That's incremental modeling, okay? I'm gonna run it and I'm going to actually stop the model. Oh, it already went, okay. Um, okay, if I went and I looked at the population, what would I see? It's five years in, what am I gonna see? Everyone's gonna be a smoker. It's kind of like a, a public health officer's nightmare, right? How about this one? 
Oh man, you too, you too. Current smoker, right? Oh man. Um, be kind of nice. Be kind of nice if, if we could see that visually. Don't you think? We could see what color they were? Uh, by color, rather, we could see what state they're in. That might be a nice thing. We could, we could then, at the model, at a glance. Ladies and gentlemen, an ancient based model, one of, its, one of the things that it can enable that's very powerful is tapping in to the human visual cortex, the human visual system. We are, we are designed through our visual system to recognize patterns. People are exquisite at recognizing patterns. We're very poor at telling what even a simple model's logical implications are, even the most quantitative amongst us. But we're very good at spotting visual patterns, spotting subtle differences. And any uh, and, and HMA's modeling, um, uh, as supported by any logic or other platforms, gives you a way of really tapping into that richly, because you can create these compelling visualizations that sometimes allow you to spot subtle things that you wouldn't have known about if you just had to depend on numbers output by the model. You can kind of look through and say, oh, that's interesting. Um, I see this. And uh, there are those in the room, and I would highlight Wade as, as perhaps foremost amongst them. But I know Narches and Paul have done some great work on, on other models creating interfaces that communicate a lot of information in a compact way. And some of the models you'll see from Wade, um, from the master's hand, will illustrate this um, because they'll have like a cockpit view of all these different things going on. But um, it will allow you to sort of look at a glance and see patterns that you might otherwise have missed. Visualizations with these models are not eye candy. They often uh, form a compelling way of communicating with stakeholders, but also in noticing unexpected dynamics in models. And so it is worth putting a bit of effort, a modicum of effort at least, into enabling a visual representation that's richer. And so it is with your lead that I will push, and I apologize, I will push your limits a bit, okay? Um, but we're going to make their color change. So I'm going to show you a way. I wish you could just do it this way, but you can't. But it'll give you an understanding of where we're going. And then we'll bite the bullet, and we'll do it, and it will be quick, and you'll soon be a happy camper because you'll be able to see visual patterns that are nice. Um, OK, so here we go. We're going to go to Never Smoker, and we're going to make this color Lime green. Lime is the color. And for current smokers, we will make them red. Red, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? Now, I wish it were that simple, that now we would run the model and everything would be happy and it would show, show nice colors on the screen. It doesn't work that way, because in general, we have many state charts. And they all have different colors for them, and it can't figure out which color to use. So what I'd like to do is ask for you to humor me for a minute. Win one, if I may, I'd ask you to win one for the Gipper. Okay. Um, okay, so here we go. We're going to go to the palette, and this is about the worst that I'm going to require people to do. Um, who are not interested in going deeper uh, jointly with me to go to a kind of nerd fest we'll have over in yonder room. Um, okay, so I'm going to drag in what's called a variable. Now, variables are another feature across platforms that you'll see. But the fact is, there's a fair number of platforms out there historically which haven't supported state charts. And the ways in which you capture state of agents is with these variables. So you say, I am 10 years old, now I'm 11 years old, now I'm 12 years old. Or you say, I'm a smoker, I'm a non-smoker, I'm a former smoker, by assigning numbers to some variable. Unpleasant, yes, but, uh, the fact, but uh, viable. Um, so I'm going to call this variable, K. 
color. Okay, now, now the, now the fight begins. We have a we have a big contingent from Australia. We have a big contingent from us from from uh, Canada. Sorry, the Queen's English wins. Color with a U. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're, we're on. Yes, Jason. Uh, we had a weird angle on your tissue. Would you mind uploading a checkpoint model? Sure. Sure. What uh, what happened? After we did, said so it needed a license, even though it was PLE. The application wasn't open, and then they Hmm. Um, I'd be glad to. Anyone want want to cover this? So what I will do is I will just finish this and I'll upload it. It was within five minutes, because this won't take long. Trust me. Okay. So we set it to color. Now and now the awful truth begins. Now the awful truth. We have to choose what's called a type, and we're going to choose. So what sort of information does color hold? Is it a is it a name of something, like a string? Is it a date? Is it a person? Is it a reference to some person, like who's my mother? No. Or who's my best friend? It's a color, and we pick color. And look how color is spelled. <laughs> According to the dictates, ladies and gentlemen, of the American Imperial. <laughs> okay, so, so um, Java comes out of Oracle, it originated in, in uh, Sun Microsystems in the Bay Area of the States, and they have dictated, like it or not, that whether you've sworn a an oath of loyalty to the Queen or not, you will spell it according to their dictates. Color. Okay? Um, this is saying colorness. It's, it's, it's dictating all possible colors, just like person dictated off personhood. This is color hood, okay? And the initial value, ladies and gentlemen, will be lime, lime, and I'm going to press, uh, and, and I'm going to I'm going to say a uh, lime, L-I-M-E, lowercase, okay? Its initial value will be lime. Hmm. And so this is going to indicate their color, their current color. Oh man, I can't believe I'm making you do this. Believe me, someday you will use our package in, that's cooking and you won't have to do this. Um, I'd like to get you quicker to that. Okay, here we are, lime. Lime, ladies and gentlemen. Like the limeys of yore, okay? Um, okay, so the initial value of this is lime. We're almost done. Now we have to do uh, just two more, three more things that are a bit unpleasant. Never smoker, we are going to set that color to be lime. It's its initial color, but just do it. And you need this semicolon. So you go here and you press entry action. You click on this and you say entry action color equals lime. Why color with a U? Because the name of the variable is color. Now, if you want to call it without a U, you can. Don't worry, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police won't arrest you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, color equals lime, okay? There we are, it's, I'll put it up on the big screen. That's what I did, okay? I said, when someone becomes a never smoker, make their color lime. And this semicolon means it's a statement. It says, let it be so. It's not computing a value. It's not calculating something. It should make it so. And it's like asking it to say, yes, ma'am. I will do so. It's like a command to it. Do it. Set my color to line. And it will say, as you please. So, um, OK. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, um, next, for this one, guess what I'm going to do? For this state, what am I going to do? Yes, color equals red. OK, you know the pattern. That's it. That's the worst of it. That's the worst of it. We only have one more thing to do in AA pad. This is horrible as far as I'm concerned. I, I feel terrible teaching you that. But it will make it really useful. And this is a pattern which we use in most models. 
it's, it's all over the place. We 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 do this, and it 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 um, it, it becomes so straightforward to do it it um, generalizes very well okay so here we are color we have someone's color indicated but now we could run the model but it's not going to show anything why not what what more do we have to do we yeah we have we have to connect it to the oval we have to make the oval know hey turn your color to be color okay so if you go up to the oval the oval is blithely just using its own color. Its appearance is white. And we need to say, no, make your color be dictated by color. Guess how we do that? Well, we can't pick color at the variable in either the spelled in the Queen's English or not. We can't pick it. But what we can do is we can do this. Click it like that, and then we can just say color, okay? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, color in the Queen's own English. Okay? Color. We made its filled color color. Now let's go run this model. TAs stand ready. TIs deploy in force. Okay? Okay, before we run the model, I'm going to press this little thing up here. This is called build model. And it basically asks any logic, hey, do you understand what this model is saying? Do you understand this model? Do, does it does it make sense? It's like, is it grammatical? Do you understand it from a grammatical standpoint? And it says, yes, I do. So if you press this and it says build completed successfully, it means it's a happy camper. Okay? I think the U.S. has happy campers. And Australia probably does as well. Okay, it's not just Canada. <laughs> happy campers, that's good. Okay. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, in fact, I knew that. Um, Dan Quayle, the uh, attempted vice presidential candidate, um, he actually was vice president, wasn't he, um, under George Bush. He told the state of Hawaii, everyone in Hawaii is a happy camper. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's run the model. Since it built, okay, let's run it, okay? And now we will run, and we should see something quite, quite striking. What do you see here? What happened? What's, what distressing thing happened? I'm going to try this again. What happened? Everyone started smoking. Why did they all, did they start at different times? No, they all started at once. Why did they start at once? Go back to my earlier lesson about any logic transition types. Yeah, it's a timeout of one. Okay, let's change this, ladies and gentlemen, to a rate of one, okay? So a timeout of one means after exactly that amount of time, they will change. A rate of one is a hazard rate. It's a chance per unit time per year in this case. A rate of one means on average they will become smoking in one year. That's actually one over one. Uh, if this was a rate of ten, it'll be on average they become smoking one tenth of a year. Um, but uh, but this rate of one will mean on average people start smoking in one year. But how do you think it will, will it look exactly the same or keeping the average the same? Will it be, will it look the same? The answer is no, look at that. Look at that, there's a few, st oh, okay. There's a few stalwart non-smokers there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're cooking with gas. Um, now let's make it now let's make it a rate of um, 1.0 divided by 10.0. This would mean an average of how long before they become a smoker? 10 years, ladies and gentlemen. Because the rate, it, it turns out for an exponential distribution, a, a rate is associated with a hazard rate. And if it's fixed, that means an exponential distribution associated with residence time. And the mean of the exponential distribution is one over the value of alpha, which is the, the, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the exponent, associated with the exponential distribution, giving it its name. And so 1 over 10, a rate of 1 over 10 means your average time before becoming a smoker will be 10 years. Because the rate is per year. It's a probability per in a time here per year. Okay? So if we made it 1 over 10, 1 1.0 divided by 10.0, make sure those points are in there so it doesn't do a stupid thing like dividing an integer by an integer. And there we go. And notice time goes on here. Four years, five years. A lot of people have, have changed, but a lot of people haven't. Here's eight years, ten years. A lot of people still non-smokers, never smokers. But eventually, eventually people will catch up. Here's 20 years. Still some non-smokers in there, right? Um, uh, it, some never smokers remain even after 30 years here. Um, so here we see some of these characteristics involving these transitions. These are hazard rates. Each person has a certain kick in the can each year, but in fact, each day, each second, they might go. I mean, it's, it's a hazard rate. They might leave at any time during the year. Um, uh, this can be, um, the hazard rate can be greater than one, in which case they'll tend to leave the average will be less than one year, but it will happen as quickly as it needs to, okay? So this is a transition. In general, we name our transitions. We'll say initiating smoking. That, that will be our transition name, and I'll click this box to say show it. Ladies and gentlemen, show it. So here it is, initiating smoking, okay? There we are. There we are, and I can drag it around. Um, by clicking on this, I can kind of drag this name. How did I name it? I selected the transition, I typed it in, and I selected show name. There we go. Okay, so that's great, but that's only two states. Let's, let's try one more state. What's the obvious state that should be added? Of a former smoker, an ex-smoker. People who have quit, right? Okay, so let's, let's go drag this in. From the palette, We'll drag it in here, and we'll say former smoker. What color should we make them? What do you think? Maybe, maybe um, yellow? Mm -hmm. Yellow? Um, maybe orange? Um, we'll leave it at yellow. Okay. Um, okay. Um, now let's add a transition between current smoker and former smoker. And this transition will be based on a certain hazard rate of people quitting smoking. Um, and maybe on average, people try to quit smoking uh, twice a year, in which case it might be 2.0 per year. So you may say, how could that be a probability? It's not a probability, it's probably per unit time. It's, it's like a hazard rate. So we use some biostatistics. statistics. It's it's um, it's probably the per unit time. It doesn't. It can it can be above two. All it means is the average time till they go here is less than a year. So they'll go here. But what's missing from this theory of personhood involving former smokers? What happens to former smokers all too often? They relapse, right? So we'll name this uh, cessation. We'll, we'll call this cessation. Cessation, oh, cessation, boom. Um, and we will need to put in, to have anything close to correct, a relapse state. Shall we not? Relapse, there we go. Um, okay, and, and uh, relapse all too often occurs quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll put in on average, people relapse, um, um, you know, on a, on a very quick basis. So within, let's say, uh, um, within one month. So I'll make it 12.0 per year. In other words, within a month, remember, the, the mean time in this state is one divided by this, this uh, hazard rate. So it's one twelfth of a year or one month. So the relapse is associated with a rate of, of 12. 
Now, if we want to see visually relapse happen, what do we need to do? Who needs a bit more time? We need to give it an initial color. Yeah, we need to give it a color. So all we need to do, do you remember how we, for each of these guys, we said we set the color to lime, we set the color to red, and here we're going to set the color, color equal to yellow. I kind of like magenta more. <laughs> who wants magenta? <laughs> okay, uh, who wants yellow? Okay, um, I heard two for magenta. I'll raise my hand. Okay, magenta, magenta. Okay, now let's run the model. That's all we have to do. Let's run the model now. Um, magenta, M-A-G-E-N-T-A. -E and we need the semicolon because this is a statement. It says, do this, assign this to color. And it will say, yes, ma'am. Okay, um, here we go. We're going to run it. And, and there we go. Okay, oh, do you see any quitters? Do you see any people who are former smokers? But what's happening? They keep on relapsing, and they keep on trying again, and they keep on relapsing. Now I'll tell you this. This is a, a case in point. I started my health policy modeling work with system dynamics modeling of tobacco use. And we were dealing with, with exactly this phenomenon, a model much like this one. Never smoker, current smoker, former smoker. And we had to deal with relapse. Well, one thing that made it awkward is we would get a disproportionate number of people if we just put in nominal relapse rates, we get exactly this phenomenon. A, a disproportionate number of people are current smokers because people don't stay relapsed. You know, as soon as they become relapsed, or sorry, people don't stay quit. When as soon as they become quit, they have a high likelihood of falling back it, into uh, starting smoking again. And one of the things the literature clearly showed, which we wanted to tap into, was the fact that that once someone quits, at first they have a high chance of relapsing. But after some period of time, as time passes, if they can only resist that lure of cigarettes for a certain amount of time, each successive day becomes easier. Each successive day, they're, or each successive month, they're progressively less likely to fall back into smoking. If they can stay quick. You know, so that first month, high, high, high risk. The second month, if they have stayed quit, lower risk than it was the first month. But a lot still relapse. That third month, lower relapse rate yet, but if they can stay if they can stay quit, but a lot still end up relapsing. And so in short, you have to keep track of how long they've been quit. And doing so in a system dynamics model is awkward. You end up stratifying former smokers by time since quit and you, want, you do it at finer categories for, um, uh, at, at, at for the first few months and then coarser. Here, it's actually quite easy to do. I'm not going to do this with you, but you'll find other models where I do exactly that. And basically, you could easily keep track of when someone starts being a former smoker and basically take into account that in terms of the relapse rate and basically have it as the time they have successfully stayed as a former smoker uh, rises, their relapse hazard rate goes down over time. And so you, you capture that fact, okay? So, so this is a little model, though, that illustrates dynamics within a state chart. And one of the things I want, I want to communicate, a couple, couple very simple things. One, visual depiction matters. It's really useful to actually see what's going on in a model to have it visually illustrated. Even if it means a bit of pain, being able to see visually what's going on communicates to you a lot about the current situation of the model, what's happening. A second thing is 
transition types matter. Transitions represent actions, but the rules associated with them matter a lot. Um, and we've seen how to introduce these rules and how our detailed assumptions about these rules um, communicate things. There's a final thing I want to do with this model without belaboring it, but first I want to upload it to Shuryong, to Dr. Shuryong. So I am going to take just a moment here and I will uh, go put it under this and I will say models built, oh, I think it's actually up here. Models built in class, there we go. And I will go drag it from my models folder, there we are. Um, it's called heterogeneous population, I will draw it here. And now it's there, okay? It's in the models built in class area. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, there's something I wanna do here to communicate a principle. And this principle will be valuable for running models and understanding how they work as far as using them. Even if you don't build them, you, you want to be able to run them and use them. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, right now, if we run this, we see a population that is a fixed size. It's always 100. Where, where did that 100 come from? Can anyone remind me? Where there did that come? Where, does the, where do we specify the population? Is it in person? No, it's in Maine. It's, it's a population of people. So it's in Maine here. So we go down Maine, and, and this is where it says, a number of agents. I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that it's hard-coded there. Um, let's make it something we can change across different scenarios. So the way we do this is, again, with a what? It begins with a P. It ends with an R. And with a parameter. So if we go to Maine and we go to the palette to agent, um, we can drag a parameter over into Maine. And, you know, I'll put it right below population, um, but it could be aesthetically faulted. Um, uh, but, and I will say population size. Okay. This is going to be an assumption. But it's going to be assumption not about a person, but about the model as a whole. It's, it's kind of an assumption for the global situation with the model, the population size. And its type is going to be, it's going to be a count. So its type is going to be something called an int. Um, it's a count of things, and so it's called an integer, OK? Um, so if we pull it down, hey, come on. Um, it's called an int int, okay? And it's default value, sure. It's default value be 100. If I don't specify it, make it 100. By default, if a scenario doesn't override it, make it 100. Great. Okay. Nice. Nice. Um, now, if you'll notice, if you go to the simulation, now it can specify the population size. Hmm? But in general, and this gets into the point I was addressing earlier, in general, once you define a scenario, unless you have reason to do so, you want to you want to leave it more or less defined thing. You don't want to go change it after the fact that earlier results produced with that scenario now have to be uh, they can't be reproduced with the new scenario. Um, we'll create a new scenario. I'm deliberately leaving something undone. And maybe people, I want people to think, what am I leaving undone? We're going to have a rude surprise in a minute. I'm going to say, I'm going to add a new scenario. I'm going to say new scenario uh, experiment. It's going to be called big population. Okay? Sometimes we just say population um, a thousand. There we go. We, we, we give it in the name. Names are important. Population a thousand. I'm going to change its population size to a thousand. But if I run it, what will be the size of this population? It'll be 100. Why is it 100 still? Because we never specified a key thing. We never operationalized that. We called it population size, but we didn't connect it up with anything. So just as before, we created this color. 
unless we connect it with the oval, it doesn't make a difference. It's not an instrumental factor. It doesn't have a causal impact. So the population side here doesn't have an impact on population. Um, so population here, instead of being a fixed thing, 100, what do I need to make it? Population size. Population size. There we go. There we go. There, ladies and gentlemen, lies the ticket. Okay? So, in the population, the initial number of agents is given by population size. Let's now run this model. So how did I do that? I went to population and I said, look, I didn't specify this for the initial number of agents. The initial number of agents should be given by this parameter called population size, which is an integer. Its default value is 100, but most of the time we'll specify other values, um, or a lot of the time. So if we run this, then we should see a model with more agents. There we go. Changing smoking in a most variegated fashion. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, population. Okay, so we've just seen a couple principles illustrated with this model. Number one, we've seen how we can introduce heterogeneity through parameters at an individual level. Number two, we've seen how we can introduce heterogeneity among different scenarios or experiments by using parameters at a global level, at the level of Maine. Number three, we've seen how we could introduce state charts into a person and uh, induce dynamics between them. Number four, we saw how different transitions in state charts can induce different behaviors. A timeout transition is far different in its implications than a um, a transition that's based on a, um, uh, a, a hazard rate, a, a, rate a so called rate transition. Um, uh, and uh, finally, we saw how we could associate a visualization color with things in ways that would communicate um, uh, the dynamics and how we could craft the visual display to further depend on uh, characteristics of people, such as their income, in a flexible fashion. Okay? Um, so uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, a little model we've built up. The processes you use to build this model are basically the same processes we use to build the larger models you've seen elsewhere. Okay? Models like Chin Yang will be presenting in the not too distant future. Uh, okay, I know she's helping right now for this one. Um, so, um, we've just built a little model together. This model contains, may not be obvious, but the seeds of greatness. Because it, it, it illustrates as an exemplar uh, a little bit of, of particulars. Now, there's lots of things we could do to expand this model. For example, we could bring evidence to bear on uh, smoking initiation rates or cessation rates or relapse rates. We could make people uh, likely of initiating smoking depend on a feature which you'll see just up above and which we will introduce um, soon enough, which is uh, people's connections okay, to others in a network. And uh, we could further uh, put in place mechanisms to report on outcomes of this model, such as the fraction of people who are current smokers or former smokers. This all would be readily done, but I, I don't want to I, I don't want to force everyone to go through that. I want to make it available for people on an, elec an elective basis. Okay, um, and uh, we will, for those who are interested go through some, uh, some further details about how you elaborate a model like this to build it towards the richness of models that you've started to see, see elsewhere, okay? Um, 
but this gives you a bit of glimpse of modeling in a way that should ground you to see how these transitions work um, in different models, uh, how these state charts are put together, what different transition types really mean, and the ways in which uh, visualization can be useful. So those are some comments on a little model that we've built together. Um, any questions related to this little exercise we've undertaken together? Any questions I could answer? So when we set a rate for uh, mm. the transitions, mm. do we, uh, based on some assumptions, or we just? Well, generally, um, in a lot of models, again, it depends the use of your model. If, if this is a model for theory building, you might be comfortable with using rough and ready rates that you think are you know, roughly appropriate. Just to have you think through, you know, what is the implication? I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Jan um, here uh, was someone who had it. We had an interesting discussion with the Public Health Agency of Canada, a stakeholder there. And the Public Health Agency stakeholder we were working with um, um, dialogued with us about e cigarette use, okay, and its interaction with cigarette use. They were the sponsors of this model. And one of the questions they raised was, was um, we, we're not sure actually if people at this point quit from e-cigarette use. Is there quitting that goes on from e-cigarettes? From e we don't have a lot of understanding or evidence of that. You know, to what degree do people quit e-cigarettes and how do they do it and how successful is it because of levels of nicotine exposure and so on. Um, uh, there was also questions that came up during that model. For example, how does um, the use of e-cigarettes by a person affect their likelihood, that same person's likelihood of falling back if they quit cigarettes, falling back into use of cigarettes? So these are sort of questions that you could imagine a stylized model, you know, with just e-cigarettes and cigarettes and looking at the interaction, getting some understanding about how two processes which might be uh, a little bit simpler to understand in isolation, although not trivial, how could they interact? And what would be the implications if there is and is not you know, an interaction of this sort or, or uh, uh, quitting from e-cigarettes, et cetera? Um, so if you're building a model for theory, build it. And for sort of, you know, just as a thought piece, thinking through how things could fit together, um, how, what dynamic patterns might be generated. You might use very rough and ready estimates, you know, that are roughly probably not so far off. Um, and, uh, and try using it to reason about how things interact. By contrast, recognizing that over, probably you're gonna see patterns that are in some way gonna result over a wide ranges of assumptions about these. They're, they're gonna have different variants of the patterns. How quickly it changes will be different. But the overall pattern of an S-curve, an oscillation, or of a decrease and then a rise, or of a overshoot and collapse, those will often be very robust in terms of qualitative patterns that result over a wide range of parameters. So if your goal is building theory and understanding at a qualitative level what results, maybe rough and ready estimates are perfectly fine. If you're interested in a model that is strongly evidence-based and that is being used to evaluate policy trade-offs or to precisely understand what are the different drivers uh, behind certain trends you see, to what degree it's X versus Y, to what degree it's better reporting versus greater incidence or what have you. You're gonna probably sweat some of these incidence rates and some of the models we'll be seeing over the course of this week, like Young's model with uh, diabetes and pregnancy, or Wade's model with pertussis, uh, with Alberta Health Services and, um, and colleagues, uh, University of Alberta, um, or, or uh, models that uh, Wade will be presenting on chickenpox, or models uh, built with the Ministry of Health here. Those will be really sweating these details about where these rates come from. Right. And um, some of them might be measured from primary data.
that we have access to. Um, some might be from the secondary literature, looking at, um, again, uh, per comments with Dr. Sri Young before, um, you know, studies associated with, uh, with calculating competing risks analysis or, or uh, survival analysis. Uh, they may be based on RCTs in certain cases uh, that controlled for certain factors and helped us understand how one particular factor might be driving things causally or other causal models per the Judea Pearl tradition. Um, you know, there's, uh, we might use meta-analyses to inform these that's done on some models or systematic reviews. There's a lot of different ways we'll evidence, uh, we'll bring evidence to bear on things like hazard rates. And we won't do it the same way for all models because um, the model purpose will shed light on how important it is we pin this down. Some models, we want to understand over a wide variety of different assumptions about initiating smoking, how model behavior differs. We do this a lot, you know, infectious disease epi. Um, we examine how does the behavior differ as we assume different patterns and parameter values, you know, different values, at what point does it go extinct, at what point is it, you know, strongly endemic or what have you. So, so here, you know, what we assume about parameters and how tightly we try to estimate them and from what sources will depend a lot on on model goals, what we're trying to get out of the model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in general, as I said, the estimates that go into small things like pieces of a model often are available in a measured way, even if understanding of why the system exhibits emergent behavior for large parts of it or the whole of it it you know needs to be elucidated. So often we do have information about the pieces of things, many pieces of things, if not all. And those that we don't have information on, as we'll see later in the week, we often end up using calibration um, on or even more sophisticated techniques uh, that we can tap more recently um, uh, that, that might allow us to estimate um, estimate these parameters, even though we don't have specific information about that because it's hard to measure, we will try to align our assumptions so it best explains the patterns we do have about you know the balance of people here or here or here over time. We'll assume a, a rate here which allows the model to best match that. Um, and this is very, very common. It's called parameter estimation, automated parameter estimation or calibration. Um, and so we often engage in that. We'll be talking about that in another two days. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, good question. Good question. Um, other questions about this sort of model? We saw mechanically how you build it. I want to I communicate something that might have really struck you from Bryce's presentation. And this actually gets back to my last boot camp. Um, boot camp on data science and system science and why they're so compatible and why they, they need each other to reach their own, each of their potential. Um, why they're synergistic. Ladies and gentlemen, these days with tools such as AnyModger, other tools out there, Increasingly, our ability to articulate theory with a model in these sort of packages outstrips our ability to quickly gather evidence to inform that model. In the course of three days, we could create a very descriptively complex model, and in fact, technically, the, you know, the dynamically complex model of hypertension in LA and involved all sorts of factors as you saw. Well articulated, very well articulated by Bryce. But you know that often isn't the bottleneck. Articulating the model, the, the mechanical construction of the model is not the bottleneck. Um, you take any number of these students in here and they can create a model, you know, mechanically like that. But the bigger question, the bigger challenge is often making sure that model meets your needs and, and evidencing the model in a way 
that, that meets your needs. Choosing what model to build is often more important than, um, you know, it's, it's often the weightier decision than, than actually building it up. Now, um, this isn't true for everyone. I mean, there, there's going to be many people, it's going to take a bit of time to learn how to build these models, how to implement them. But in the grand scheme of things, with the right team, you have someone like the students and here teamed up with health scientists. You know, creating the model to articulate a certain theory is 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 is, is very doable. It's a matter of, of mechanical putting together of the model and you know, software engineering and sort of piecing pieces together and, and very flexible software platforms. But the trickier thing is how do you build that model in a way that's responsive to your model goals? And that includes, for many models, evidencing it. So the type of model which Bryce showed, you know, if you wanted to build it up as the UCLA and uh, LA Department of Public Health collaborators would love to see in the medium and long term to be really well evidenced and to bring understanding to bear, um, you'd really want to you know, it'll be, it'll be an activity of a couple of years to really tie that model down and all its different pieces and, and all sorts of different pieces. It, it really takes that long to gather evidence well for these models in a traditional way. And this is w one of the reasons why I, I actually am engaged so heavily um, as the creator of systems to collect health big data, to inform our models, of systems that automatically incorporate new data as it comes in to, sh to hone what's represented in the model in a way so that it's consistent with that evidence automatically and, and basically to try to smooth that process of evidencing models because um, it requires a lot of dedication to build up a model. And someone like Wade, for example, if we look at Wade's model uh, right now uh, on, um, on, on pertussis, um, the latest model, the, the model of, of waning rates. You know, that's been being worked on now for, for what, a, a year? Something like that? Um, I, I, two years. Two, probably soon. two years, yeah. And what's, what's the bottleneck there is not clicking and dragging things and building the model. It's not, you know, enabling this and putting in color and arguing about whether there's a U in it. What, what's the time-consuming thing there is really thinking through what's the theory here, sometimes look at the literature, try to find evidence which the model could be compared against, testing it, finding that it doesn't match up against the real-world evidence, adjusting its assumptions, um, tapping into uh, uh, you know, uh, literature sources of evidence. These are the things which take time with the right team. It used to be, when I wore a young man's shoes, um, it used to be it would take a long time to, to, to build the model of that size. It would have taken a lot of programming to build. That has been greatly reduced through packages like AnyLogic. That's really reduced as the bottleneck. The bottleneck now, by and large, is, is setting up the model to meet your goals, which means picking the scope, appropriate and evolving that scope as you learn, and, um, and evidencing the model and getting the feedback to sharpen it and finding the model doesn't jive with your understanding or stakeholders' understanding of the evidence and refining it accordingly. It's learning from the model. It's not a matter of building model. Here we built a little model. In older times, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, um, uh, when I was building my first models, um, uh, building a model like this would mean writing a lot of code. And um, now, you know, we can do it in a little session here together. And we can build much more sophisticated models. So just be aware, when you're talking about undertaking a model development project, the hard part is not actually physically building the model anymore. The hard part is making sure that model meets your goals by evidencing it or by by crafting its design and evolving it to meet your needs. Um, just a word from the wise. You know, um, been around here a long time, and uh, 
one of the reasons the students in this room do such a good job is because they can cross both areas of the body. They know how to build the model, but they're also savvy about trying to wrangle evidence in a way that can be put into the model and, and talking with stakeholders that can help them locate sources of evidence to inform to inform of you know uh, certain transitions, etc., and that's that that addresses more centrally these needs. And there's not many people around who can span that divide. Um, if you hire a regular programmer and you say go build the model, the programmer is not going to know about how to simulate things in the world. They're going to know how to do calculations in Java, and they don't know how to characterize things. You need people who who are savvy about how to model uh, parsimoniously, but also how to bring evidence to bear and how to design things to communicate, et cetera. So um, those presage some comments later in the, uh, in the week. But just be aware, building a model um, mechanically is not the big constraint. The big constraint is often making it meet your goals. OK? Questions? More questions? More comments? You have your first model, I posted it. And uh, we'll be building more with those who are, uh, well, we'll be building more together, but especially with those who are interested and take it further. Okay, so um, I am going to uh, close that uh, session here.